uh, and uh, good morning to our panelists and to just under 100, it may be 100 right now, participants. So we're delighted with all of you who have chosen to uh, take the next hour to join us for our episode three in our Tip of the Iceberg series. Uh, today's theme is Immigration and Workforce Development in Newfoundland and Labrador, featuring two of our 20 funded research projects focused on understanding and increasing immigration in our province with all of the benefits that come with that. I want to say that there are many individuals and organizations and associations and government departments and community organizations uh, that are already supporting and doing uh, a lot of work in this whole area of supporting immigration. So I, I want to recognize that and acknowledge that. Uh, but so, but today's webinar is really just the beginning of the conversations that we look forward to leading, promoting, and the, and and looking forward to bringing all the labor market stakeholders together to continue the conversation on this very important priority for our communities, uh, our organizations, and our province. So my name is Sharon McLennan. I'm the director for the Newfoundland and Labrador Workforce Innovation Center at the College of the North Atlantic, and your moderator for today's virtual panel. In the, spirit of in, in the spirit of reconciliation, I would like to respectfully acknowledge the territory in which we gather as the ancestral homelands of the Beothic and the Mi'kmaq. I would also like to recognize the Inuit of Nunasivut and the Nunatukavut and the Inu of uh, Natasinan and their ancestors as the original people of Labrador. The agenda today um, is as follows. So I'll introduce Jeff shortly as a technical housekeeper and our media information officer at NLWIC, as well as the producer of today's webinar. I'll then deliver a presentation, providing you with an overview and update on the uh, Newfoundland and Labrador Workforce Innovation Center, before introducing you to each of our panelists, who then will present for 15 minutes each. We'll then open it up for Q&A from participants. So over to you, Jeff, and then it'll be back to me for the presentation. Thank you, Sharon. I'm just going to uh, share my screen here now for the technical housekeeping portion. Uh, so just so everyone's aware, like I said, we had a couple of uh, people join in a little bit late there, but the event today is being recorded. Uh, so with regards to technical issues, uh, your audio and video have been disabled by default upon entering the session. And we ask that you please keep your microphone muted unless you are speaking. This will cut down on any background noise. If you have any technical issues, please send me an email. My email is jeffrey.keeping at nlwic.ca. With regards to MS Teams, there is a control bar at the top of your window that you can see. If you wish to view the participants list, you can click the participants uh, button right here. To view the conversation window, click the button next to it. For your reactions or to raise your hand uh, during the Q&A portion, uh, you can click that right here. More options is the ellipses next to that. To start and stop your video or audio, uh, you have your camera button and your microphone button. And if for any reason you need to leave the meeting, which we hope you actually get to stay around for the entire meeting, but if you do have to leave, just simply click the leave meeting button. To view the reactions menu, click the react, and then you can click the raise hand button right here. Uh, so when you have a question during the Q&A portion, I'll be able to get to you. Uh, for the conversation window, click the conversation button at the top of your screen. This will open up the window on the side. You can type your message at the bottom, and then the messages will appear here on your screen, uh, and the, the messages are viewable by everybody in the meeting. And if you uh, need to access the more options menu, click the ellipsis at the top of your screen, the three dots, and you can check your audio settings and your video settings at the top. And if you need to turn on live closed captioning, you can click it right here uh, near the middle of your screen. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Sharon, uh, who will continue on with her presentation for the NLWIC. Sharon? Thank you very much, Jeff. I'm going to share my screen now. Okay, so again, um, looking forward to walking you through um, really an overview and update of NLWIC, including um, our latest announcement on January 11th of the uh, economic focus ideas and immigration ideas lab. Okay, next. So I hope to, my intention is actually to answer two questions so that you have two takeaways at least from today and, uh, and maybe more, but for sure too. Uh, what have we been doing and uh, 
what is the center? And a lot of you know, but I want to just take you through both our past and, and our future, really, our new mandated activities. And what have we been doing? And what is NLWIC's Economic Immigration Ideas Lab and what next? Okay. So first of all, uh, I'd like to talk about uh, what what we are is really who we are as well as NLWIC. And I, I think I keep uh, uh, my analogy as a, as a table because we are conveners and we lead that. But the first leg of that table is a very important one. It's really the NLWIC team and a number of you have met uh, some, if not everyone on that. But that's what makes our world go round. And I really appreciate the enthusiasm and passion of this team. And uh, right now it's six, but we're about to uh, go to uh, add four more into the future because of our new mandated activities. Next. Uh, we're funded uh, through the uh, Department of Immigration, Skills and Labor under the Canada, Newfoundland, Labrador Labor Market Development Agreement. We're administered by the College of the North Atlantic. We're part of the Partnerships and Innovation team led by Trudy Barnes, they're our VP. And of course, we're at the top and that really just signifies our contract or contractual obligations under the contract between ISL and CNA. So our third leg is really our mandate. We were established in 2017 with a provincial mandate to provide a coordinated central point of access to engage all labor market stakeholders about challenges, opportunities, and best practices in workforce development. Our goal is to promote and support the research, testing, and sharing of ideas and models of innovation and workforce development that will positively impact employability, employment, and entrepreneurship within the province's labor force and particularly underrepresented groups. And newcomers, of course, would be one of those underrepresented groups, which is what we're going to be talking about today. Next. And then our fourth and final leg is uh, really it's all about our collaborations and partnerships. We're very proud that we've been developing strong relationships provincially. And, and a number of you know those, those names, the Association of New Canadians, uh, Genesis, Navigate. And then nationally, uh, both at the Atlantic Regional level, the Workforce Partnership, Brookfield Institute at Ryerson University. Uh, we continue to be a partner with them on a past uh, research project, a follow up to that research project. We're about to begin a new one all about uh, job transitions, uh, job trans transition pathways uh, from disrupted and declining industries in, and occupations into growing ones. And we're very excited about that. The Business and Higher Education Roundtable is a key um, convening partner with us. And uh, we just finished a series of work integrated learning virtual sessions, engagement sessions, focus groups. And we'll continue to work with them and the Conference Board of Canada on their regional sounding tour about the Future Skills Centre. The Future Skills Centre uh, is really exciting. We're about to begin a research project with them that wraps up one of our new mandated activities that I'll talk about in a few minutes. Uh, but it'll be looking at evaluating and uh, assessing or testing the, Im the impact and the development of a new model of workforce development in this province. The Labour Market Information Council, another national organization that is doing some significant and very important work around labour market information and making it accessible to uh, all the labour market stakeholders. And so we've been uh, working with them and hope to continue to work with them on a number of initiatives. The Ocean Supercluster Startup Project, that whole uh, supercluster is doing amazing work. And we we're so pleased to, to be able to help launch and moderate a, that uh, the kickoff of that project uh, a few months ago. And then we have relationships with the other four workforce innovation centers in the country. And as a director, I meet uh, monthly. And then finally, we were, we were delighted last year to be part of a relationship or research collaboration with the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. And we became one of two case studies in their um, Canadian portion of an international uh, research project on skills use and its impact on workplace innovation versus workforce innovation. And, uh, and with some really, really interesting recommendations for how we might move that forward. Next. So just to remind everyone, why was the uh, why was NLWIC established? It was because we were, we like the countries and provinces around the world are facing labor market challenges, and you can see them there: aging and declining population, out migration, recruitment and retention, changing technology and automation, skills shortages and mismatches. But we like to focus as well on the opportunities. There is demand in in some key sectors. We, we've heard about technology, sorry, the technology sector including the green sector and, 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 and uh, the clean energy sector for sure, uh, mining sector, 
Uh, so there's a lot, there are, there's really uh, rays of hope and we continue to see that this demand will drive the need for increased uh, and innovative workforce development and workforce overall. Uh, that which leads me to the second opportunity, which is really on the supply side. It's really there. We have a, you know, traditionally um, the participation rate of underrepresented groups has been lower than it than it need be, and that's why the it's really important. And we've been promoting the broadening, and we're hearing this across the province that, that diversity and inclusion is becoming a priority for sectors and organizations and the province. And this is really really important. So the idea is that if we can focus on looking at innovative models around increasing participation in the labor market, uh, then that's really important. So when we talk about underrepresented groups, we're talking about uh, older workers, we're talking about youth, women, persons with disabilities, indigenous peoples, persons on income support. Um, so there's a full range of, of individuals that we hope that to, we'll, we, through our research and the evidence that's produced from that research, that we will have models that we can start sharing with employers and with other labor market stakeholders to say, here's what works, here's what doesn't, and this will help you in your talent uh, needs in the future. So, and then finally, there's an opportunity for more workforce and workplace innovation that impacts employability, employment, and entrepreneurship. Attachment and to the workforce is key to us, to NLWIC, and to our province, and to the individuals and communities that really want to thrive uh, now and into the future. So our original core four, four core functions were stakeholder engagement, and that continues to be our, you know, our current ones as well, and that's led by Suzanne Dodd. Fabulous job of bringing individuals together and also us being and attending and collaborating and listening to where, what, what ideas, challenges, best practices are in workforce development. Research funding has been a major area and uh, I'll, I'll, I have a slide on that or two slides that will just, just touch on uh, what that has meant, but that we provide, we have provided through two calls, funding for research projects in workforce development that test new models, tools, technologies. Best practices repository, uh, is one that we're currently, it's a high priority for us. Our research projects, a number of them are coming to a close. We're getting final reports. We, the key now is adoption, adoption as policies and programs and new systems delivery models by government. It's also a, where it makes sense and the evidence points to that. And it's the same thing for adoption um, and use uh, by, of the tools and models of workforce development by employers and by other labor market stakeholders. So that's going to be a key one. So we're working now with the college and my colleagues within the college, with the workforce innovation centers, and with Magnet to see if there's ways that we can collaborate to, to make that happen so that research doesn't sit on a shelf. It gets disseminated, it gets tracked, it gets used. The evidence is, uh, you know, we know if it's working, what, what becomes, what, how we build on that. So we're really excited about that. And then finally, capacity building. How are we going to work with employers, with the college, with other training providers, community and, and employment service providers to, to know how to, to use the tools? And just really quickly, we've had two calls for proposals. Uh, and the first one, uh, you can see some of the projects there. We're going to focus on the Genesis Center today um, and, and their report on exploring ways to foster innovation and technology entrepreneurship with increased female participation and immigration initiatives. So we're really excited about that. But there's a whole range of, of uh, projects and you can see the value of that first one was 3.171 million. The second call uh, uh, valued at 4.492 million. And again, this is uh, being managed under the leadership of uh, Joanne Kendrick, our uh, innovation and, and research uh, project coordinator. And so again, more university, you'll, you'll be hearing from, from uh, Dr. Fong today about employer perceptions to hiring newcomers and international students in Newfoundland. What are the results to date? What are the early learnings to date? And, uh, and, and uh, looking forward to sharing those with you and, uh, and uh, seeing how this may help address some of the key issues and barriers that we're hearing in uh, for immigration in newcomers in Newfoundland and Labrador. Next. So just so this one just says we touch almost all the sectors in this province. There's a couple we haven't and we look forward to it through future uh, research collaborations like the Brookfield Institute one to look at uh, oil and gas and um, and construction hopefully and, and transportation. Those are the only three that aren't there but in terms of underrepresented groups, all the research projects either focus on one or two or more or all of those underrepresented groups as research participants in the 
in the models that are being tested, et cetera. So this is, the, I'll start to wind down with our new mandated activities. We're really, really excited about this. The first two on the top, the impact of technology on businesses and changing skills requirements and the workforce development committees. Um, these are two initiatives that, uh, that will, be, uh, will be rolling out in the coming months. Um, and it'll, that'll be wrapped up in the future skills uh, project that I, uh, I referenced earlier, uh, that will test an innovative workforce development model. And at the end of that one year project, we hope to have a, what they call a playbook uh, working with the Future Skills Centre that can be shared both within Newfoundland and Labrador about what works and what doesn't when you're setting up and rolling out these workforce development committees. Are they working? Are they having the outcomes that we, we, we have them, uh, we want them to have? And then also sharing it with uh, other provinces and organizations across the country and beyond. Uh, underrepresented groups are a great initiative that uh, we're almost we're in, in the final phase of. Uh, again, uh, Suzanne's been leading that engagement through uh, of underrepresented groups. We've learned an awful lot. We've heard, we've done consultations with 17 organizations representing underrepresented groups, 10 government departments. We're going to have a virtual engagement session very shortly. And then that will culminate in a final report that we will present with recommendations to ISL. So that's really exciting and, and we've learned a lot. So we've, we, we know what we're hearing from underrepresented groups, including newcomers. So we're, we're really going to hit the ground running with, uh, with the final new activity, which is the economic immigration focus. Ideas Lab announced on January 11th. Um, we're very excited about that. It's really about uh, that lab should identify practical approaches. We like, we like to say made in Newfoundland and Labrador approaches to facilitate newcomer participation in the in the provincial labor market. And I just wanted to just to talk about really briefly uh, that with the lab and, our, and and what we're doing in the next steps. So we're we're looking forward to bringing that to life. It'll be we're headquartered uh, as an NL WIC in at the College of North Atlantic in Cornerbrook, but this will be both a virtual and over time hopefully a physical lab that will but it, it is provincial in scope and um, it is a social innovation lab and social innovation labs are all about how do we address complex issues and you do it by bringing together the key stakeholders with the right expertise and perspectives identifying the key issues and then and then helping through you know facilitated the right the right people doing it what are the solutions what are some practical solutions we can test and then hopefully implement that will address the key issues. And in the case of newcomers, a key one is how do we make sure we're recruiting and retaining newcomers in our communities? So we're very excited about the Made in Newfoundland solutions. We hope that we will, we will promote leadership within our communities to embrace uh, this common goal of increasing immigration and becoming welcoming communities and, and, and with diversity and inclusion as a key, key priority for all of us. We have heard there are barriers that I've mentioned, uh, you know, I, I've said that already, so I won't go through that. So, but we do have that, but we will be bringing together uh, before the end of March, a, uh, a focus group of key stakeholders who we will talk to about the, uh, the launch, I guess, the ideas lab, but to listen and to help us validate what we've heard to date, to add to the issues that we've and concerns we've heard to date, and to then start to mobilize uh, the rollout of, of the ideas lab. And that's going to mean we're going to have the hiring people. We're looking at all those things now and then looking at a number of practical ramp up, you know, uh, steps. But that's what we're doing right now. Um, we've already done some best practices research and we'll continue to do that, particularly as we bring on some new staff for that. So um, I think I'd, I'd like to finish that one by just saying stay tuned. Uh, we're excited about it. And this will be my final slide really is why I was going to say why NLWIC still. We talked about why NLWIC was established. Uh, I'd like to end with these uh, five uh, points. We continue to align with the province's priorities and requirements and that of the college around increasing innovation, underrepresented groups, labor market participation and immigration. We address and continue to address collaboratively labor market challenges and opportunities that face our students and all of our labor market stakeholders. And this is really key. We do have a mandate to provide that coordinated point of access, and this is what we will continue to do. We do attract and fund research and other collaborations based on, you know, the sharing of expertise and knowledge and tools, et cetera, to help Newfoundland, but also the rest of Canada in efforts for regional and economic workforce development and recovery. We're promoting Newfoundland as a testbed for innovation and NLWIC at CNA as a leader in convening, collaborating, incubating, and promoting that innovation in, in, in conjunction with all of our 
partners and uh, with the college and in consultation with ISL. And then finally, we engage and document the barriers and challenges to workforce development by employers and by underrepresented groups, as well as share and promote the replication and scale up of the tools and models that are coming out of our research and our consultations uh, for the benefit of all of our labor market uh, stakeholders and particularly workforce development and innovation. So I think, Jeff, that would be it. And uh, thank you very much for your attention to that. Uh, and I look forward to now the uh, next part of our agenda, which is to introduce our two panelists. I'll introduce one at a time. So first of all, uh, we have Dr. Tony Fung. He's the Stephen Jaroslawski Chair in Economic and Cultural Transformation at Memorial University of Newfoundland. Currently, he holds the J. Robert Beister Faculty Fellowship at Rutgers University and sits on a World Bank Expert Advisory Committee on Migration and Development. He served as president of the Chinese Economist Society and the domain leader at Sarah's Ontario Metropolitan Metropolis Center. He was a visiting professor at Harvard and NBER and Morton School um, at the University of Pennsylvania. And in 2017, he was selected in the Thousand People Plan of the Sichuan Province. And in 2017, he was elected as a fellow of the Royal Society of Arts. So without any further ado, look forward to uh, Tony's uh, presentation on his uh, one of the two research projects that we have funded to date uh, that I've already introduced you to. So over to you, Tony. Okay. Uh, let me do the stuff. All right. Uh, don't know if we can. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Just, yeah, we just need you to put your uh, your screen on slideshow, Tony. Yes, I did that. I'm not sure if you can see it or not. Uh, I think it's already did that. Can you see the slides, Sharon? Yes, they're not large and full screen, but we can see them. Okay, um, that's better. <laughs> so if you, if uh, the only other thing I suggest, and then if not, if you should just begin, would be from the beginning, if you can just click on that. Okay, that so. works. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Okay, uh, good morning, everyone. Thanks, Sharon, uh, again, for your gracious introduction. And um, also thank you for your team for organizing today's events. Of course, also uh, your generous funding support to this exciting project. So I'm pleased to share with you today uh, some uh, the first round of uh, research findings from this four year project. Uh, so of course, we're going to do a follow up longitudinal survey of employers uh, later this year uh, by incorporating also this unique context of the COVID uh, global pandemic and how that would affect the labor market dynamics and hiring attitudes and outcomes employer in the province. Okay, so this is just highlights of the, uh, the mission of the uh, uh, NL uh, week. And you can see the ideas, innovations, impact uh, are mostly um, identified here. So, uh, so basically here, uh, we have done this uh, research to uh, a mixed uh, massive approach. Uh, the qualitative um, component, which is the uh, employee consultation uh, in collaboration with St. John's Board of Trade, uh, the Public Policy Forum, and ACOVA. And uh, the quantitative version, which is funded by the uh, center here, we have done a stratified random survey of more than 300 employers in the province. So basically the research finding here today can be generalized to the uh, general population of employer in the province, okay? So first of all, the idea is not entirely new, actually my colleagues at the Memorial Economic Department, uh, Wei Lock and Scott Lynch has done a study uh, 2005, uh, but that was 15 years, more than 15 years ago. Since then, uh, demographic factors, technology, and immigration policy have shifted dramatically 
So it's very uh, you know, important to have our updated research, uh, especially uh, because the uh, government recently have introduced a number of uh, new immigration initiatives, such as uh, uh, AIPP and also uh, PMP, that place heavy emphasis on the role of employers to fill the shortages yeah. and Excuse the me, local, local labor market. Okay? Excuse me, Tony, I'm sorry to interrupt, but right now your sure. uh, slides are not advancing. Okay, uh, mine's still moving. I don't know why. Uh, so uh, maybe something to confirm. Jeff, uh, keeping, Jeff, can you see, uh, what, what are you looking at? Are you at the first slide? All, all I see on my screen is the first slide. Yes, correct. Yeah, is the cover slide. Uh, uh, is that okay moving? Now it is. There, now uh, it is. Now it is, yeah. But, yeah, but it's not full screen. This has happened before. Sorry. Uh, so um, let me make it bigger, maybe. Uh, that's probably it's better. All right. So, uh, so this was done 15 years ago. So, um, uh, you know, the uh, two components, as I mentioned earlier, employee consultation and also a survey of more than uh, 300 employer in the province, okay? And uh, the uh, major um, objective, of course, to identify and offer solutions to mitigate any barriers uh, to employment that uh, recent immigrants and international students might uh, be, uh, be facing. The other is that identify, um, you know, so-called evidence-based best practices and a policy making process in order to uh, help immigrants to uh, find a suitable employment in the province, uh, such as diversity training, um, you know, uh, labor market information, and so on and so forth. And finally, to help uh, immigrants and refugee international students become more productive participants in the labor force and improve their well being and long term retention and integration in the province. Okay, so this is the first part of the project, uh, which was supported by St. John Board of Trade. We identified some key industries uh, for that consultation, including energy, business, IT, and education. Okay, so this is a sponsored by a Public Policy Forum based in Ottawa, Harris Center, and Memorial University, and also, of course, the uh, uh, St. John's Board of Trade. Okay, so this is before the survey, and then we have done number of pre-testing uh, in 2019, summer 2019. And the first survey was delivered um, between September and October, okay? And uh, which is stratified uh, by uh, industry, uh, 18 industries and size, uh, three categories, large, medium and small and, and location, uh, urban and rural, okay? So just give you a little bit of kind of snapshot of the sample description. As you can see, the key industries here, including retail trade, 27%, and uh, healthcare, social assistance, uh, more than 10%, and uh, accommodation for service, 16%, and uh, and so on. And this is what I would like to highlight is on the right panel, uh, the percentage of owners or CEO who are actually permanent residents or international student, temporary foreign workers, uh, you know, they're uh, way higher than the proportion of population here, okay? For example, uh, immigrants are kind of only for two to three percent population in the province. However, they represent uh, more than eight uh, percent of the CEOs or owners, okay? So similarly for international students and temporary foreign workers, um, so basically this is what my colleague Leslie probably would talk about, right, recent immigrants international students are way more entrepreneur than local population. Uh, also, we know that um, most of the company are private sector organizations, and uh, the, uh, also they have more uh, SMEs, small, medium-sized enterprise, and most of them are also located in the urban area. So uh, this is a key issue here in the survey. Uh, do we have labor skill shortage in the province? You know, when I do this CBCPC crosstalk was asked, you know, given that we have persistent high employment, more than 14% unemployment rate, and do we really have labor skill shortages? We do, of course, this is before pandemic. 43% employer in the problem reported uh, labor skill shortages, okay? And why this can happen? Because of the 
so-called skill mismatch, right? At you know high uh, skilled occupations, doctors, professors, lawyers, so on, be very difficult to find local worker fearless positions. Again, for low paying service occupation like the restaurant, fish plants, uh, mining, agriculture, and so on. So there's also uh, challenging to find local workers who are willing to uh, take those positions. So on the top industries, including transportation, warehousing, accommodation for services, trade, healthcare, social assistance, construction, and professional scientific technical services, more than 40% of those uh, employers in the industry reported hiring difficulties. Again, turning to occupation, that's exactly what I just mentioned, this dichotomy of the uh, labor gap here. So on the top, highly skilled occupations, tech, especially technical trade, 58% employer reported difficulties of hiring. And followed by 48%, this is less skilled uh, categories, production workers with no trade certificates, you know, very high fine local workers to fill those positions, followed by 13% professionals, 11% manager, highly skilled. So uh, again, moving forward, okay, in the next three years, this is what projected by the employer in the province, again, before the pandemics, okay? And even high proportion, 53% of the employer expect hiring difficulties uh, in the next three years, okay? The main reasons for such hiring difficulties um, on the top, uh, a lack of applicants with necessary skill, too few applicants, lack of applicants with necessary skills, okay? Again, there's some kind of uh, diversity here. For example, uh, urban employer turned to report uh, labor skill shortages because lack of applicants with necessary skills and experience. In the rural areas, employers uh, tend to report uh, be just because too few applicants, lack of warm bodies. And this is not surprising, you know, we have this population declining almost in every community in the province uh, outside of St. John's, okay? By industry, okay? And for trade accommodation for services, again, as we know, main reason is too few applicants. For mining, oil, gas, manufacturing, healthcare, social assistance, and so on, the main reason is lack of applicants with necessary skills. For construction, the main reason is remote location. Remind us the mass product for projects, you know, all the mining, uh, projects in, uh, um, you know, those uh, Navador and so on and so forth, okay? And in terms of hiring activities, okay? And first of all, you see uh, the percentage of employees receive, who received uh, applicants from newcomers, international students, and proportion of the employer who actually hired them, okay? And there's a clear pattern here, as you can see on uh, uh, overall, in total, you can see that category. 60% uh, employers in the province received application from newcomers. And among them, 48% actually hired them. Okay, this is pretty high percentage. There's also a clear pattern by firm size. Large firms, uh, large organizations typically report, um, you know, high percentage of receiving, 87% receiving applications, 78% also hire them, okay? This is also interesting. Looking at uh, the um, immigrant status of CEO owners, okay? And uh, the percentage of receiving and also hiring is also higher than the sample average. Okay, this is not surprising. And uh, in terms of perception or experience of employer towards newcomer international students, overwhelming uh, majority, okay, 87% uh, employer in the province uh, had positive experience with newcomers and international students, okay? So the main reason behind that positive perceptions on the top, Okay, number one, 79% because strong work ethics, hard working. Okay, and followed by reliability, 25%, strong skill, 20%, friendly attitude, 20%, willingness to learn, 15%. And this is more detailed attitudes of employee towards hiring newcomers, as you can we separate the sample into two categories, those who have hired and those who have not. Okay. As you can see, you know, just take example, multicultural uh, workforce enhanced creativity in the work, 
place, 61% reported agree, strong agree for those who haven't hired. Even more positive, 82% for those who have hired already, okay? And immigrants uh, take jobs away from locals, last two uh, you know, rows, um, only 8% agree, 69% disagree for those who haven't hired. Uh, even high percentage, 87% disagree, okay, among those who have hired. Immigrants uh, will work for less pay. This is all common perceptions or misperceptions, okay? Uh, then local workers, only 22% agree for those who have, haven't hired. Uh, 17, even less, 17% uh, 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 you know, agree, okay? And 55% disagree. So overall, I think the attitudes and perceptions towards immigrants uh, and international students, highly positive, okay? So the other issue we're talking about here, which is very critical for immigration policy makers in this province is the recruitment retention. Not only we can attract immigrants and international students to this province, can we actually retain them? Can we, can we keep them uh, in the problem for longer run? So here the issue here is the main reason why actually immigrants are leaving, okay? And the 31% uh, are due to uh, moving away, okay? They move to MTV, other provinces, okay? And uh, 20 one percent, uh, you know, left organization because it took another job. Okay, so the majority, oh, majority, I think, uh, the leavers are due to they've been attracted to some other problems in cities. Okay, and others just because of the contractual or performance uh, reasons. Okay, and uh, some, you know, in because of the you know the turnover issues, some uh, employers actually have gone actual Myers. Uh, to retain newcomers, uh, but the percentage is very low. For example, some employers have changed workplace practices to better accommodate the needs of international immigrants, but only 10% of organizations have done so, okay? But for those who have done so, they also have very much uh, higher, uh, uh, you know, positive attitudes towards hiring international immigrants. Still, some employers have helped employee become a permanent residents or land immigrants. Again, only about 13% organization have, have done so, okay? Again, they have experienced, expressed a positive uh, attitude towards hiring uh, international immigrants. So the survey also uh, asked about the areas of improvement in terms of immigration policies and uh, organizational uh, programs and so on and so forth. Okay, and those are the issues highlighted by our respondents. Okay, for example, improving language training for immigrants. Again, this is a joint responsibility of the uh, you know, federal provincial government and also educational institutions and settlement agencies. Okay, 71% um, of respondents agree or strongly agree, okay? followed by uh, developing program, encourage cultural understanding. You know, there's a big issue about uh, this immigrant uh, retention issue is that uh, sometimes there's, you know, cultural misunderstanding or biases against newcomers. And uh, so this has been uh, mitigated, can be mitigated by training. Uh, providing more labor market occupational information and services. We talk about, you know, the big issue for labor skill shortages because skill mismatch. We have high employment rate, but at the same time, we also have a lot of vacancies. Uh, an implemented program to bridge skill gap for immigrants, enhance credential recognition. It's a huge policy issue as well for federal provincial government. Just to conclude, um, uh, number one is that, you know, we do, uh, you know, despite a high employment rate, we do have skill labor shortages. So it's very important for policymakers or organization to uh, remove the so-called skill bottleneck, to, you know, in order to encourage long-term economic growth and prosperity of the province. The role of employers is crucial here, okay? The second is that overwhelming majority of, uh, you know, uh, employers uh, in our survey reported 87% uh, positive attitude towards immigrants. And the most important reason have been, um, you know, um, strong work ethics, reliability, uh, strong skills, qualifications, and friendly attitudes, okay? 
And uh, they also reported some uh, challenges, mostly due to language barriers, cultural differences, lack of social network, and the costly timing, time consuming immigration process. Okay. And finally, in order to attract, retain, integrate immigrant, international students, temporary foreign workers, and refugees, employers need to take the lead to drive opportunity for recruitment retention of immigrants. The government should provide effective support. They also need for increased collaboration and support between different share, uh, stakeholders, including government, education uh, institutions, employers, NGOs, and even the media. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Tony. That was an excellent uh, overview and update on your research project. Very, very important research and, and helping us understand the issues and also the opportunity. So thank you very much for that. I'd like to now introduce Leslie Galge. She's a success manager uh, for diversity at Genesis. And Genesis, again, is one of our uh, 20 research projects. Sorry. She has over 10 years of experience working in local entrepreneurship ecosystem. She's prior to moving to New, back to Newfoundland in 2011, she, uh, Leslie completed MBA studies in Copenhagen, Denmark. And her focus there was international business development innovation. And she was in Toronto for over five years around that whole innovation management and product development uh, space. Uh, she has a great entrepreneurial drive and desire to support the local system. And so she pivoted in her career from large companies to locally owned SMEs and began to explore the intersectionality between women and immigrant entrepreneurs and dedicated herself to addressing the barriers, pursuing a designation as a certified diversity and inclusion professional. Uh, she's very attracted to the growth and potential in the local technology sector. Uh, she now focuses uh, her attention on developing and delivering diversity, equity, and inclusion programming at Genesis and partner organization. She holds a, a, a BCom from Memorial and an MBA um, and is a certified business retention expansion professional and a certified and in process a certified diversity and inclusion professional. Great and welcome uh, Les Leslie and can't wait to have your update and overview of the research project. Thank you, Sharon. That was great. And thank you, Dr. Fung. Um, really great to see positive attitudes towards immigrants in the local, um, I guess, workforce, but also interesting to see a lot of commonality in the barriers that you presented and the barriers that I am about to present. So I will share my screen and make sure that my slides can progress. And uh, Tony, I think you'll need to start to, to stop for sharing. Okay. All right, so as Sharon mentioned at the beginning, um, Genesis put a proposal in in 2018 to NLWIC and at that time, the title was Exploring Ways to Foster Innovation in Technology Entrepreneurship Through Increased Female Participation and Immigration Initiatives. The wording has been changed a little bit. We'd like to say through increased participation of women and immigration initiatives, just to be a little bit more inclusive. Sharon or Jeff, can you confirm that the slide has progressed? It has. OK, thank you. So before I start, um, I'd like to give a little bit of a background about who Genesis is for those who may be unfamiliar. So we are a technology incubator and accelerator. We're located at the Amera Innovation Exchange on Signal Hill. And essentially we're here to help build amazing companies. So as Newfoundland and Labrador's preeminent innovation hub, we're known primarily for our flagship incubator program, Enterprise, which is our three year in a, uh, incubator accelerator program. And that actually began more than 20 years ago, which not many people um, really know. So since then, Genesis has expanded its pro programming to support startups from the ideation, ideation stage all the way to scaling their businesses. We also have a pre-accelerator program. And our mission is to create economic wealth for the province by developing and supporting technology entrepreneurs. So the idea, what was the research question that we had and how did we approach it? I apologize because this is a little bit of a mouthful for the research question, but it was what impact will the creation and expansion of targeted and innovative programming have on reducing barriers to entry 
for marginalized groups in the technology sector, and therefore increasing the number of companies with female and or immigrant founders in Newfoundland and Labrador over a three year span. So of course, Genesis had some assumptions about what the barriers were from, from a larger uh, technology sector perspective, but the first step was to dive into the research and to test some of those assumptions. And it's important to note that we looked at the barriers to entry for women and immigrants um, in the technology sector entrepreneurship for the purposes of this research um, and not the technology sector as a whole, because of course there are some nuances with that. So why is this important? Why do we want more women and immigrants to start technology businesses? Well, first and foremost, entrepreneurship is important to the economy and diversification. EMY did a global job creation survey and it found that entrepreneurs are actually creating jobs at twice the rate of established companies. So we need more entrepreneurs to create more jobs. Entrepreneurship creates jobs, it creates wealth, drives innovation, increases competition, therefore productivity, promotes international trade and the list goes on and on. Yet at the same time, Newfoundland is significantly below the national average in terms of propensity to start a business. Now, I do want to preempt that by saying it is from a 2013 study, so it, it, it is a little bit outdated. But the Global Entrepreneurship Monitor in 2013 stated that Newfoundland has one of the lowest rates of, of uh, people planning to start a business within the next three years. So we know entrepreneurship is important. It creates jobs, yet we don't have enough people starting them. However, immigration is important to the health of the entrepreneurial ecosystem. In Canada, the rates of small business ownership tends to be higher amongst immigrants than locally born. Um, and that's a Stats Canada statistic. And there's also higher rates of exporting. In Newfoundland, we also know that we are leading, in Newfoundland and Labrador, sir, we are leading the Atlantic provinces in the growth of self-employment in women. And Atlantic Canada leads the country, so this is a huge opportunity. Newfoundland tops the charts at 48% growth in a five-year period by TD Economics, and it is predicted that COVID-19 will have a drastic impact on the participation rates of women in the workforce. So these barriers to entrepreneurship need to be addressed so we can continue to build on that momentum. So we know entrepreneurship is important. We know that uh, Newfoundlanders don't have the propensity to start businesses um, well below the national average. We know that immigrants do want to start businesses. And we know that in Newfoundland, women have a higher propensity to start businesses. So all of that is a strong business case. Now, why the technology industry? So locally, the tech industry is a is valued at about 1.6 billion, and we've seen significant growth locally. And we also know that there's about 400,000 in value for every tech job created. So you put it all together, and it makes sense. And why not? Why not attract people to start up here? So why Genesis? Why are we interested in, uh, in understanding the barriers and why are we positioned to help address those barriers? Well, first of all, Genesis has a mandate to develop and support technology entrepreneurs. It is in our best interest to understand what may be holding an immigrant founders back in an attempt to develop more, of course. Incubators and accelerators like Genesis are designed to address the networking, education, and capital challenges that all entrepreneurs face. But what we've learned are that these challenges are most acute for women and immigrant tech entrepreneurs, suggesting that incubators and accelerators could have the greatest impact on their ventures. So we know that we can make a significant difference. It's important for us to understand the barriers to be able to attract more and then to be able to support more high growth firms here locally. From 1997 to 2013, which is a bit of an alarming stat, the percentage of female founders at Genesis was 0%. So that's the first 16 years of the programming. 
In 2018, the percentage had risen to 31%, which gave us access to data and insights about the lived experiences of these women entrepreneurs and encourage us to ensure the retention and success of the growing portfolio. We need to build on the momentum of change. Also in 2018, Genesis became the only designated organization in the province for the startup visa program. And the startup visa program aims to bring skilled immigrant technology entrepreneurs and their families to the province. So to attract, develop and retain these high growth potential founders, we must understand the local barriers to immigrant entrepreneurship and actively address them. It's a very fruitful talent pool. Finally, we are in a position to make an impact. Genesis is a respected partner in the entrepreneurial ecosystem and technology industry. Our connections and stakeholders can effectively spread the facts regarding the barriers to entrepreneurship for women and immigrant technology founders and collaborate to address those challenges head on. The approach. So how do we gather the data and insights given that we are not a group of researchers? Well, first things first, we hired a dedicated talent and diversity coordinator. It's important to have resources dedicated to any sort of diversity initiative. All too often it's done off the side of someone's desk. At the, at the outset, there was a lot of research that had to be done, conversations with affiliates across Canada, local stakeholders, partners, Genesis companies and graduates. We then tapped into our network of incubators and accelerators from across Canada. So the research we'd, we've done is localized, but it was important to find out if the same barriers were being experienced across Canada. And we found out that they are. We leverage local connections in the technology industry and entrepreneurship ecosystem. So we really benefit from the close connections that we have, the close community that we have. We leaned on our memorial affiliation. So through MON, Genesis was able to tap into research that had been completed around attraction and retention of women in STEM, for example, which supplemented many of the findings that we, that we have on the intrinsic barriers, which we'll speak to shortly. Then of course, we tapped into our company. So between 2018 and 2020, Genesis accepted 27 new enterprise companies Nine of those companies had immigrant founders and six companies had female founders. There are some overlap with female founders who are also immigrants. However, over the course of the three year period between 2018 and 2020, we had direct access to over 40 companies uh, who were continually feeding insights and recounting their lived experiences to us. So it was essentially a living lab to test Now to get into the barriers. So for the purposes of this presentation, the barriers are uh, for both groups are presented on the same slide as there is a lot of commonality at the higher level, but of course there are nuances. The first that we'll look at is the lack of role models, which actually came up more predominantly with uh, women entrepreneurs. So only 5% of tech companies in Canada have a solo female founder and only 13% have a female co-founder. That's our move dial. It's very difficult uh, to be it if you cannot see it. And a lack of role models also exasperates the feeling of not belonging that we'll speak to later as well. The next barrier is around the lack of connections and networks, which came up for both women and immigrant founders. So we know that having a strong network can help a startup be more successful in the early stages as networks provide both personal and professional support to an entrepreneur. Yet female entrepreneurs tend to have smaller, less formal and less diverse networks, are less likely to have interacted with people who have key resources and are less likely to grow their networks by joining business associations. On the immigrant founder side, lack of connections and networks is, or maybe simply a byproduct of not being from here, not knowing who to get to know, which then exasperates another one of the barriers around knowledge of local practices, procedures, and pathways, which is where we're going next with lack of knowledge. So the lack of knowledge does not necessarily mean that women or immigrants are less business savvy or that they lack necessary technical skills. 
but it's more so due to the lack of role models, connections and networks. And that, of course, exasperates the feeling that they may not have intimate knowledge of the supports and pathways that are present. Therefore, the lack of knowledge is more around lack of knowledge of the infrastructure. Sorry, skipped a bit too quick. The next uh, barriers around access to funding, which again is something that came up with women and immigrant founders. Only 4% of female founded startups are met with venture capital cash, which is just a, a, a drastic statistic. And added to that, Newfoundland has one of the lowest participation rates in angel investing in the country at about 2% which is below the Canadian average of 3.9%. And that suggests that the market for informal investment capital is still relatively small and underdeveloped in this province. So not only are female founded startups um, getting less, less access to venture capital, but they're also receiving less. So women on average receive less funding from VCs which may have some correlation to the low number of VC firms that have a female partner. There's only a, about 30% of Canadian VC firms that have a woman as a managing partner. The lack of diversity around the boardroom table may be affecting uh, who's receiving investment. Beyond venture capital, women also have more difficult time accessing traditional bank financing. Some of that is a, around the lack of credit history in certain circumstances and tend to have a lower propen propensity to borrow. Access to traditional bank financing is particularly difficult for immigrant and newcomer startups as they need to have um, permanent residency status prior to receiving and that is often a very long process. And they also experience bar barriers around lack of credit history in Canada. So now on to some of the more intrinsic factors. Um, we have definitely only scratched the surface here as these relate more to the internal roadblocks, which are often further provoked by the barriers that we've already talked about. So on the woman entrepreneur side, the idea of work-life balance came up quite a bit in conversation. The search for balance may mean that a woman assumes that she cannot develop her skills, grow her network, attend meetings, seek growth opportunities, find and develop customers and suppliers all simultaneously. Entrepreneurship is not a nine to five job and it's sometimes uh, looked at as being even worse in the technology industry. Female entrepreneurs also express a, feel, a fear of failure, fear of entering traditionally male dominated sectors and fear of economic volatilities. So basically there's a, a lower risk tolerance. We also heard about imposter sy syndrome. So the feeling of not belonging, which came up time and time again in conversations with women in technology. They feel they don't fit the mold. They don't see themselves uh, you know, through enough role models. They question the culture. Then on the immigrant founder side, language barriers actually came up quite frequently. But it's important to note that language barriers can manifest in a variety of ways and that are not always linked to English as a second language proficiency levels. So even for those aspiring entrepreneurs with Canadian language benchmark level five, which is the minimum requirement for those applying for permanent residency under the startup visa stream, adapting to local communication styles can be troublesome. Likewise, a fear of judgment and the assumption of bias based on the way that they sound was found to be a barrier, often more prevalent and impactful than issues adapting to local communication styles. Finally, the limitations in service support infrastructure. So we have a number of support organizations in the province. However, research suggests that the promotion of and subsequent skills enhancement for entrepreneurship as a career option and pathway to workforce integration is sometimes limited within these service providers. And that may be likely a byproduct of resourcing. But beyond the gaps in the provision, provision of the service itself, societal barriers exist within the constructs of these organizations and institutions. 
These barriers range from unconscious to conscious bias to lack of skills and training on the topic of diversity, equity, and inclusion. An absence of awareness and skills enhancement for employees and leaders within these investor groups, service providers, the systemic barriers will continue to exist. And that will, of course, lead to more exclusionary practices and lack of sense of belonging. So on the innovation side, how do we start to address these barriers, which is where our focus is right now? We implemented so far uh, a number of programs, and of course, those are continuing to develop and evolve. Addressing specifically barrier number one on the role model side, we did a number of things. We started by introducing a speaker series, sharing stories of inspiration and advice. So we welcomed a number of successful women entrepreneurs, particularly with a focus on STEM, to share their journey and, uh, and offer advice, like Gina Picor and Kendra McDonald, for example. We developed a women in tech peer group. So the peer group now has over 200 members and a dedicated Slack channel where people can pose questions, ask for advice, et cetera. And that spun off into a women in tech strategy group where we engage senior, senior women leaders in tech, emerging leaders and male allies in determining a way forward in the broader ecosystem. Then in November uh, 2020, we held a You Are Here virtual event in partnership with ANC uh, to share stories of immigrant entrepreneurs, which was attended by over 100 and led to more collaboration. On the lack of networks and connections barrier, we started by holding a workshop on how to build a dream network. We had Kelly Hoey share her story from an angel investor to founder to VC partner, and she provided advice on how to best create network you need to succeed. We provided direct connections for portfolio companies. So part of the Genesis value proposition is to facilitate connections and develop networks. And we try to make a concerted effort to do that more often, especially with women and immigrant founders. And of course, the nature of the incubator itself facilitates that type of daily network building and connection making. We built extra networking time into programming and events. Uh, we have the Women in Tech peer group, as I, as I just mentioned. Um, we did things like mentor mashup events, which are essentially a, a speed dating for networking. On the lack of knowledge side, uh, we did some curated presentations from industry partners. So we facilitated information sharing around pathway navigation. Um, with presenters in you know, everything from legal to funding agencies to financial institutions and support organizations. We did a lot of direct intervention and solution development through um, dedicated one-on-one -on -one success manager support, someone knowledgeable about the barriers. We also facilitated connection and network development. So our portfolio companies have a dedicated Slack channel as well to share insights, knowledge, and ask, ask questions if they're more comfortable um, uh, speaking that way. In terms of um, access to funding, uh, this is where the NL WIC support uh, came in in spades. So we implemented a micro fund, um, not just limited to uh, female and immigrant founder founders, but um, definitely gave us more, more leeway to uh, provide more support that way. We initiated a prof professional fees fund and a travel fund. Um, and as I'm sure all of you can imagine, a lot of fees related to, you know, the legal portions of setting up a startup, um, travel required for business development can be really burdensome. So this helped our female, our women and uh, immigrant founders quite significantly. We facilitated more venture capital connections with emerging firms like SheEO, for example. We did a lot of introductions and application assistance with federal and provincial government. So in December of 2020, as one example, the provincial government provided around 275,000 in non-repayable funds to female and immigrant founders. On the intrinsic factor side, um, again, as I, as I mentioned before, we're just scratching the surface there, but we did start with some leadership development sessions. So programming like leadership development is a great start, but course there's many layers of the onion to peel back there and what we've we've started to pull some insights from that leadership development 
and identified some deeper le level barriers like imposter syndrome and work-life balance, which are at the program development stage. We did some intercultural communication training around the fear of being judged on accent and perceived lack of English language skills. Um, and that came up with in conversations that we had with our own clients, as well as um, discussions with other service providers in the ecosystem. We really tried to build on the culture of belonging at Genesis, and that was an essential piece to overcoming the intrinsic bar barriers. We had to instill a sense of belonging. We had to create a safe and equitable environment that celebrates the wins and losses and provides individuals with unique solutions. On the service support side, of course, we had to focus on our own uh, level of service support. And we, we did that first by allocating a dedicated success manager at Genesis solely focused on the advancement of women and immigrant founders. Some future programming includes the enhancement of the support. And then of course, DEI education and training for Genesis stakeholders and uh, enhance collaboration and knowledge sharing amongst the entire ecosystem. The impact. So what does all of this mean? Did the programming work? So this is a look at our current composition. And those numbers have been consistent over the past year, um, past three years, sorry. So up from three female founders in total in the years prior. Right now in our enterprise program alone, we have 33% representation by women founders. Representation of immigrant founders began to shift around 2014, 2015, but has increased 10 to 15% since 2018. So on the left side of the screen, you'll see the uh, participation in our enterprise program, which is our flagship three-year incubator program. And on the right side, you'll see participation in evolution, which is pre-accelerator. It's more on the validating your ideas uh, stages. The impact, and I, I will say that these numbers are extremely conservative given that they, they measure um, the new immigrant and female founder companies that we had since the 2018 time period. So, female or women and immigrant founders who had availed of the services within Genesis prior to our programming being rolled out aren't included here. Um, regardless, we have about 2.5 million in annual revenues and 25 plus jobs created, which is really impactful. And here are just some examples of some of the great successes that we've had with companies currently in our portfolio. So we have Castor, um, a husband and wife immigrant founded company, and they have uh, recently just uh, become the fastest company in Genesis history to reach the milestone 1 million in annual reoccurring revenue, and that was in year one. So that's just phenomenal. We have Milksta Brew, which is a female immigrant founder. She, uh, just before Christmas, successfully pitched to CBC's Dragon's Den, and uh, she may become the second fastest company in Genesis history to reach the 1 million milestone. Then we also have Granville Biomedical, which is a, a phenomenal company, um, female founder who quickly adapted to respond to the pandemic gap by developing a scalable and comfortable nasal swab, and that'll now help her to diversify her products, uh, swab products into um, further avenues in women's health. So that is it for me. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Leslie. That's uh, amazing, um, um, I guess, impact. And then uh, thank you very much for the, describing the idea, the genesis of, excuse the pun, of the research project as well as the uh, methodology and, and then of course the results. It's great, uh, uh, great conversation. And well, right now it's been, uh, we need to have the others, other, uh, maybe uh, another event 
to include the conversation from our participants. And we have run out of time, but I think it's been invaluable. And I do hope that uh, those who are online today will join us when we have another event that will give us a chance to actually talk about what you've heard today. But there are some really exciting models uh, that are being developed. The research is really increasing our understanding of what's happening. And, and with the Economic Immigration Ideas Lab, we'll have that platform to be able to bring uh, people together to address the barriers that you talk about and your solutions and, uh, and some suggestions. So I'd like to thank everyone today for their participation and please stay tuned. The conversation has only just begun and we'd love to keep uh, you engaged in this and other conversations of uh, the Newfoundland Labrador Workforce Innovation Centre. Thank you so much, everyone.